Attention, Sundance Film Festival. Please include my newest feature film, Grigging a Cooking Competition Part 2. Okay, so Sundance 2021. Uh, it was all virtual this year. And so I was able to, uh, well, actually, they extended an uh, invitation to me. Uh, they were like, hey, uh, the movies this year, they're a little bit subpar. So uh, do you think you could make a YouTube.com uh, sponsored tier list video? And so, of course, uh, you know me, I'm all about the tier list. So um, I said, yes, of course. And so I'm very happy to announce that this is the first Sir Chancellor sponsored content. And I know what some of you may be thinking. Oh, but Ben. Uh, Sundance was almost a whole month ago. Why is it taking so long to get this video out? Uh, and the reason for that is so how we're gonna do this is we're gonna have um, S tier and F tier reserved for only one film uh, S tier will be the best and F tier will be the worst uh, We're gonna go in order that I watched them and so let's just jump right into it Warning so the chancellor did not plan this video and much of it is repetitive and boring your discretion is advised so the first thing I watched was One for the Road, directed by Baz Poonpiria, which I just realized I don't know how to pronounce, so I apologize if that is wrong. Uh, the reason this one sort of caught my attention was because I saw it was produced by Wong Kar Wai, and I was uh, familiar with uh, Baz's first film, um, not first film, previous film, Bad Genius from 2017, although I didn't see that one, I had heard about it. And so I was very optimistic going into this, this was the uh, world premiere screening or whatever, and so I was excited about that, but unfortunately, I did not care for it as much as I would have liked to. Uh, despite the two and a half hour runtime, it just really felt uh, sort of underdeveloped, at least a lot of the characters did. And so a lot of the sort of emotional aspects really just fell flat for me. And uh, I'm looking back at my review because again, this is like a full month ago, but uh, I sort of wrote about the overbearing, like emotionally forced music, even though I don't really remember that now, but. Uh, if I wrote it, then it must be true. A lot of the, like, humor or lighthearted aspects really did work for me, especially with the uh, actors in the film. But, uh, unfortunately, that felt really, like, out of place in the larger narrative of, like, sorrow and nostalgia, which some of, did, some of which did work for me. But, uh, overall, it felt really, um, kind of unnecessary and... Well, not unnecessarily, but just really underdeveloped. Like, a lot of the things that I liked about it didn't really follow through in the end. It was worth the watch, I would say, but still uh, kind of left me feeling a bit uh, underwhelmed in the end. So I'm going to put this, for now, I think C tier, because I gave it a 6 out of 10. So it's either going to be low B or high C. I'm going to put it in C for now, but we'll probably bump it up later. All right, the next film I watched was another premiere called Censor directed by Prano Bailey Bond. Now this was a horror psychological thriller type meme, and it's about like the sort of video nasty uh, censor era of the 80s, which uh, is something that really interests me. It's from a uh, Welsh director, I guess is worth pointing out. And I really enjoyed a lot of it. it. It was a bit shorter, if I remember correctly. Yeah, only 84 minutes. And while it definitely did, like, interest me, and I thought a lot of it was really cool, it still feels incredibly, like, self-contained. This is uh, her first feature, by the way. And so it did kind of feel like a bridge between feature and short, as it was like kind of like a Black Mirror episode. I'm sure someone else has already said that, but it kind of just felt like, um such a like cool self-contained concept that was kind of stretched into feature length and because of that i think it definitely did have some pacing issues as well as just kind of like got a bit boring at some parts but i think uh overall i've seen mixed reviews of it but uh for me personally i really enjoyed it i mean again i sort of have my own bias towards it as that sort of stuff really interests me especially if you are a fan of horror, a fan of that sort of uh, video nasty history, although it's not about that, but it still has a lot of that in there, and so I am going to put that at B for now, I gave it a 6 out of 10, I gave both of these a 6 out of 10, and we are going to move on, <laughs> alright, Strawberry Mansion, uh, this was quite possibly, I, I recorded a vlog, um, I was like vlogging myself like before and after each screening, 
and I deleted it, I scrapped it because I was like 40 minutes of footage and I was like, this is not entertaining. But um, I remember <laughs> right after I watched this, I said, um, if this is the best thing I see at the festival, then I'm fine with that. I, I mean, I just absolutely love this thing. It's directed by um, Kentucker Audley and Albert Burney and uh, it was made by someone named Kentucker, and so I think that kind of gives you everything you need to know right there. I remember, like, directly after I watched it, I was like, yeah, this is... <laughs> this definitely has so many issues, but I'm willing to put all of them aside because of how awesome this thing is. I mean, like, the the effects, and it's... I, I don't know, I feel like it's hard to explain to someone who hasn't seen it, and I feel like I do have to give context before I just, like, start rambling around about it. It has aspects of, like, um, Eternal Sunshine and the Spotless Mind. It's like a guy, <laughs> how do I say it? It's about a dream auditor, and, like, the government taxes things in your dreams now, and, like, some distant uh, future. Not so distant future, that's what it says. Basically, it's about a guy who goes to this uh, house and audits the dreams of this lady who has all her dreams on, like, VHS tapes. And from there, it just gets uh, absolutely <laughs> crazy. I mean, it's it, it's it's definitely an experience. It's not about the plot. It's one of those things like it's not the more you think about it, the more issues you realize with it. And that's definitely the case for this. I mean, I definitely think it's good and I absolutely recommend it when it comes out. But I don't think you can really say that it's a masterpiece or like a great filmmaking, if that makes sense, like structurally and like even just in terms of the writing, it, like, it doesn't make very much <laughs> sense. But it's about the atmosphere, um, the effects, and the production design. And it's like that really sort of uh, surreal 80s dream aesthetic thing. Uh, and all of that is brought together with the Dan Deacon score. Which is like super synthy and like uh, reminding me kind of of the Fez soundtrack. Uh, so if you're a fan of that... Uh, at least listen to the soundtrack. I don't even know if that's out, but even if you don't like the movie. But yeah, I mean, it's such like a visually like pleasing thing to watch. It reminded me a lot of um, the 1977 film House in terms of like the uh, purposely cheesy effects. But, and there is a but, if you strip away all of like the fun elements and just look at it objectively, I think you see a lot of glaring issues. Uh, which again, I, I kind of already mentioned, but like how messy and like unorganized it is like um there are entire stretches that just feel completely rushed and under development or underdeveloped but i mean i'm the type of person uh, that enjoyed this so much i mean i can put all of that aside because of the uh crazy time uh, it offered so for now i think we're gonna put that in a tier all right next we have crypto zoo which is the only award-winning film i saw uh, I, I only went after, I only picked um, films that I knew that I was never going to hear of after Sundance. Because things like Coda or Flea or whatever, like, once those come out, like, worldwide or become available on digital, like, I know for a fact I'm going to see them and hear about them, like, later in the year. But I feel like Censor and Strawberry Mansion, like, those would go completely under my radar if not for Sundance. And so that's why I wanted to give a bit of an explanation as to why some of these things, like, if you watch... I'm not like the other reviewers. I don't just go after the big movies. I go after the cool ones. And that's why that's why you're watching me. Crypto Zoo is an animated film directed by Dash Shaw. And it is just... All I can say is just go and see this. Like, I'm telling you now, go and see this. Because, like, movies like this just don't get made very often anymore. It's just that type of... Uh, hand-drawn animation that just really is essentially dead at this point. I mean, it's incredibly rare to find not only just a hand-drawn animated film, not even just a 2D animated film, but uh, especially one not marketed specifically for brain-dead children. Like, this is just like a fun experience while still being like for, you know, adults and everything. And so that's why, I mean, this is probably one of the best things I saw at the festival. If, this is probably my number one recommendation for people to go and see because I really want to see more stuff like this get made even if it's not my favorite thing that I saw at the festival. So yeah definitely putting that A tier above Strawberry Mansion. Alright next up uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and put this <laughs> in the S tier because yes this is my favorite thing that I saw at the festival. It is the Sparks Brothers directed by the one and only 
Edgar Wright in his debut documentary. Um, I went into this knowing nothing about uh, Sparks or their 25 albums, uh, but I left knowing <laughs> a good bit about them. So don't feel like you have to know like things about Sparks in order to watch this, because first and foremost, it is an Edgar Wright film, more than it is a documentary about the Sparks Brothers. It is an Edgar Wright documentary. And so if you are a fan of him, then uh, definitely watch this. But that being said, obviously by the time you finish the 135 minute runtime, you will have developed an interest in the sort of Sparks Brothers, uh, I guess, lore. And so it, I think it definitely works as well as it does because of that combination of Edgar Wright and the sort of, uh, I guess you would say charisma, or just the characters that are Ron and Russell to really make this like a sort of super engaging uh, deep dive into the sort of uh, life and works of the Sparks Brothers. And so it was really entertaining and definitely got me into their music. Um, so I definitely recommend it. <laughs> All right, um, up next we have a glitch in the matrix. Let's go ahead and put this right here where it belongs. So this is a film from the director of Room 237, Rodney Ashner. And so there is a bit of a story behind this one. So uh, on my letterbox, I reviewed all the films and I tweeted out each of those reviews on my Twitter. And so I opened up Twitter after tweeting this review and I saw someone had uh, retweeted it uh, or quote retweeted it with the caption counterpoint. And it took me a second to register, <laughs> but the account was named Rodney Ashner. So yeah, this definitely was the um, worst thing that I saw at the festival. I was actually at the premiere. I saw it um, world premiere right there. And this is out now, actually. So if you are interested in seeing something that is hilariously bad, this is the film for you. Um, it is just <laughs> so laughably ridiculous but it's taken so deadly seriously. And I mean, it's just like such a like, oh, it's a big brain moment. What if like, if you think about it, like if the simulation is perfect, then we wouldn't really know if we were in a simulation now, would we? And it, it, it really just isn't any deeper than that. And so I'm actually going to go ahead and read the review that I wrote for this on Letterboxd, which actually has gotten 37 likes, which is my most liked review. This is a super serious documentary that contains Clips from an actual Tanamonjo video about the Mandela Effect, clips from Rick and Morty, Reddit posts, Minecraft gameplay in the first two minutes, clips of Elon Musk on Joe Rogan's podcast, a grown man describing how the AI in the simulation is just like the villager from Minecraft, someone being really bad at playing the first level in Doom. All of this is in the same documentary which contains a lengthy sequence of a man describing how he murdered his parents. Real tasteful stuff. All right, next up we have The Dog Who Would Not Be Quiet, which I'm gonna go ahead and put in D tier because I really um, didn't think it was that great. It, it was, it tried to be like a slice of life, um, like parable almost, um, but it just really did not work in almost every regard. And I mean, I was sort of, I wouldn't even say um, entertained by it. I really just did not care for it that much. And I definitely thought that even with the sort of twist that it has towards the end, um, it really did not make up for it being just not very uh, deep or like have much meaning, I thought. It just really, um, really fell flat for me. And I, I think maybe some people have a different experience, but yeah, I really um, did not care for this one. So next up we have the Swedish film Pleasure, directed by um, a, a YouTube video claims that the name is pronounced Nina Tiberi, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not 100% on that. Um, yeah, this is definitely um, probably the second best thing I've seen this year, uh, let alone Sundance. It's super well made and super um, engaging and uh, even though it is kind of hard to watch at parts, it's um, by far like such a well I, I'm just gonna keep saying <laughs> well made over and over but it's because it's true uh but yeah I feel like if I discuss the plot like any more than I already have I will get uh, banned off the internet so yeah definitely um a good pick for family movie night um I'm giving this one an A tier all right, up next we have Coming Home in the Dark. Um, I don't have much to say about this one. It's pretty dark and grim, 
but uh, other than that, I think it's really well crafted and um, yeah, <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and put it uh, behind um, Pleasure and above CryptoZoo. I really like this one, even though um, it, it is pretty straightforward, like just um, like funny games-ish, but um, yeah, I really liked it. I thought it was well crafted and yeah. All right, the last thing I saw at the festival was we're all going to the World's Fair. Um, this is definitely um, the most weirdly like controversial take I'm gonna have, I think. But uh, I'm gonna put this, um, I think, above uh, the dog who wouldn't be quiet here. Yeah, I think that's right. Basically, the plot is that this like uh, young girl uh, starts who's a YouTuber. It's basically about me, actually. But um, she does the World's Fair Challenge on YouTube, and she has to vlog herself um, like as the changes come. I mean, it, it's obviously um, not supposed to be taken like incredibly literally. It's very um, slow, and I guess you could say, I guess you could say meditative if you if this is for you. Um, but it was definitely not for me. Um, I thought that. I thought it was good. Like, there was a lot of stuff I liked about it. Like, I don't think this is a bad movie. I think it's the ending. <laughs> I'm laughing just thinking about it. I was, like, crying laughing at that ending, man. Oh, I, I, it, it was, I, I, I get why people like this, but I don't see how you could, like, reasonably justify that ending. It was, it was so bad. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I need to rewatch it, but I just thought that this was, um, not very good. I, I, I don't know how to put this exactly because there was so much that I liked about it while also so much that I hated about it. <laughs> like it, it focused again kind of like um one for the road except like super amplified. It um focused on the stuff that I really didn't like and then just completely like punch in the face for that ending is so awful <laughs> um i don't know um if you disagree uh let me know in the comments why you liked it all right the last thing is judas and the black messiah um i did not see this at sundance but it did premiere and i saw it on hbo a couple weeks later um so i'm just including it on the list because why not um i'm putting this high a tier i thought this was probably um, one of the um, most well-made, like, crafted uh, drama, thriller type things that I've seen in a really long time. I mean, you have a super high quality cast, and with this story, it's just so, like, um, I don't know, I don't even know um, how to put it. It's just super interesting, I guess. Like, the entire history behind it, uh, it interests me anyway, um, regardless of the uh, film itself. But the film... The direction is so good, and the music especially, it's just so uh, engaging and well-crafted, and that is why it is number three on our list. And so yeah, I think this is probably good. I'm thinking, I, okay, yeah, I think we're going to move Strawberry Mansion down to high B tier, um, so that we have a more balanced out thing, because Strawberry Mansion was good, but I don't think it deserves to be in the same tier as um, like these, because this, these are good for a different reason. This is still just fun. So yeah, this is going to be our tier list. Uh, let me know what you agree, what you disagree. If you want to hear me uh, go more in depth on any one of these films, I could make a separate review. But yeah, uh, I apologize for kind of the uh, low quality video. I just, uh, I kind of realized I haven't really been doing much on the channel lately. And so I wanted to put something out this week, uh, even if it is a bit uh, less high quality. It's super well made, really well crafted, I thought it was well crafted, well made, like crafted, uh, drama, thriller, t engaging and well crafted, crafted, craft, 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 crafted uh, drama thriller type things that I've seen in a really long time.